Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. I'm Emmanuel, I'm a former Boeing 737 pilot and welcome to our tutorial series for the iFly Boeing 737 MAX. We are going to fly the United Flight 2356 from Las Vegas to San Francisco, which is about a 1 hour and 10 minute flight and just about perfect to learn how to operate the Boeing 737 MAX. If you have already seen my tutorials for the 737NG, then you will probably be familiar with the procedures in these ones, but there will be some small differences since we are operating a slightly different aircraft here with the 737 MAX. All right. So let's go right into it. In this tutorial we are going to deal with the flight deck safety inspection, some initial items and the walk around. And the very first thing we do is upon boarding the aircraft we have a quick look around the surfaces and chocks around the aircraft. So we make sure that there are chocks in place and we check if there is any personnel operating on any of the surfaces. Now. When that is done, let's go ahead and board our aircraft. And down here we are in the cockpit of the 737 MAX. The next thing is we're going to check the maintenance status and verify the tech log registration agrees with the aircraft registration, verify the maintenance status is acceptable for flight and ensure agreement with authorized dispatch deviations if required. Now, when this is done, we can finally start powering the aircraft up. Now. In the real world, we would do this while we are standing in the back of the flight deck before we actually take a seat. And since it is somewhat easier for flight simulator pilots just to be seated, I am going to do this right off the captain's seat. But in the real world, we would do this standing in the back of the flight deck. So first things first, we do need electric power. And for that, we are going to use the ground power unit. So let's go ahead and turn on our electronic flight back go down to the systems page and then we can go to the sim menu and into the ground support. Over here we can connect our power unit. So let's go ahead hit set. And with that a ground power unit is connected to the aircraft. So then we are going to turn on the battery. And with the battery on we are going to turn on the ground power unit and this starts powering the aircraft up. Next up, we make sure that the electric hydraulic pump switches are off, the landing gear lever is in the down position, and then we can start our fire tests. And we do this because we might still want to start up the APU. So we're going to move the fire switch to the in up and fault test position. Now this should not trigger the alarm. That's currently a bug. You move it to in up fault. You observe the fault and the APU detect in up light come on and thereafter you t put the switch to the overheat fire detection. This sounds the alarm and then you press the fire warning bell button over here to ensure that you can actually cancel the alarm. Then we move over to the side and we are going to test the um, squibs down here and when that is completed then we can decide if we want to start the APU. Now, since we're in Las Vegas and it's already 23 Celsius over here, I am going to start the APU right now so that we get air conditioning for our cabin. Now, in order to start the APU, we can already turn on one of the fuel pumps and normally we use the forward main tank one pump. So this pump is coming on and thereafter we can start the APU. The APU will start without turning that pump on since it does have a DC driven fuel pump included so you can start it without prior AC power connected. If there is fuel in the center tanks you should also switch on the uh, center tank fuel pump switches so that fuel for the APU is drawn out of the center tank. So the APU start procedure is now in progress and once the APU start has completed you will see the APU generator of bus lights over here illuminate. There is no standard means for the flight crew to monitor the APU's progress. The EGT gauge has been removed in the MAX and there is no other gauge available. Only in the maintenance menus you would find some APU information but those are not normally used by the pilot. So you simply let the APU start and once the generator of bus light comes on you know that your APU is available. 
So, the APU takes roughly a minute to start, so it should become available any moment now. And here it is indeed. So, with the APU now running, we can go ahead and start the timer. We want to wait two minutes after the APU is started before we are going to use the APU as a bleed air source. Now, we can use the time that we have available in the meantime to continue with our safety rainbow. So, next up we are going to set the emergency lights to the arm position. We're going to test the attendant call function and observe that we have heard the um, call bell in the back. And then we are going to move down and check our flap position which is up and make sure that the flap lever is actually in the up position as well. Then we move further down to the thrust levers and we are going to move them forward one by one to check activation of the takeoff configuration warning. So you put that forward, observe the sound, then you put the other one forward and again observe the sound. Many colleagues just put both forward at the same time thereafter. That's something that many pilots do but is not technically required. Let me move further down and we are going to test the cargo fire extinguisher, which is working just about fine over here. Then we are moving back and normally we should find our gear pins stowed at the back over here, but iFlight does currently not have them, at least not in the beta version that I am uh, using to record this one. So moving on then, we are going to move over to the manual landing gear extension door, which is located just down here. That's the door, and we just make sure that it is closed and that it is properly latched. If that door is not closed, your landing gear is not going to retract after takeoff. Moving on over the side then, we make sure that all the circuit breakers are in. We make sure that the emergency escape rope is in place. Then we would turn on the flight recorder, or the voice recorder, but unfortunately that switch is currently not modeled in the iFly. From there we move further up. And then we've got the flight recorder and the airspeed warning. So we are going to start with the um, airspeed warning test. Press number one, press number two. Then we take the flight recorder switch and we move that one into the test position. Now normally the off light should have been illuminated. That's currently a bug in the um, beta I'm using to record this. When you put it into test, the light goes out. And when you put it back into the normal position, like this, then the off light should come on again and you should observe the master caution overheat, uh, overhead light over here. So that is what should have happened. Alright, moving on, we've got the stall warning test and these need 4 minutes for the aircraft to be powered with AC power in order to work. But if you press them just before, you should just hear the stick shaker do a little bit and that is normally sufficient for the test. We do that on both sides. So, moving on from there, we go um, further forward on the engine panel, we ensure that no lights are on and that the EEC switches are on. The passenger oxygen switch is guarded. We have sufficient oxygen available for our flight crew, and then we move to the left side to the IRS. Put both IRSs into the nav position and observe the align lights coming on and thereafter the on DC lights coming on. And eventually extinguishing again. Moving further to the side, we test the leading edge devices, make sure that they all illuminate, make sure that the ELT is armed and that the elevator jam landing assist switch is in the guarded position. Then we can also test the maintenance light by pushing that light in, or pushing that button in, and that tests the light. And we do that in order to ensure that there is nothing, or to ensure that there is nothing in here that would make the light illuminate, but with broken bulbs. Because when that thing is illuminated, the airplane is a case for maintenance, and you are not going to fly it. Alright, when that is done, we move over to the left side, ensure the captain's emergency escape rope is in place, go down and check all the circuit breakers, and with that, we have completed our so-called safety rainbow. Now, before we are going to go out for the walk around, there's a few things that we can do over here. First of all, ensure that the parking brake is set, unless it is required to have the brake released for brake cooling requirements. When that is done, and we are about to go for the walk around, we are going to turn on the position light into the steady position, that's the forward position, and we are also going to turn on the wheel well lights. If it's dark, also turn the logo lights on. 
Last but not least, before we go outside, in order to be able to check for any hydraulic leakages, we are going to turn on the hydraulic pumps. Before you do that, do have a look outside that there is nobody working in an area where something could start moving. And when that is done, we are going to turn both hydraulic pumps on. So, with that, the aircraft is basically prepared for us to head out for the walk-around. There is one last thing that I want to do, though, and that is because of the temperature, we have started up the APU, and since more than two minutes have elapsed since the APU is running, we can now go ahead and turn on the APU bleed, and then also turn on both air conditioning packs into the auto position, so that the aircraft starts to get cooled by bleed air from the APU. So with that done, we are going to head out for the walk around. Now the walk around starts basically next to the one left door. And I am going to go over there right now from our lovely little intro position. And we start the walk around right up here next to the one left entry door. So, we check that the TAT probe is undamaged and clear of any obstructions. And the same goes for the pitot tube and for the angle of attack vane. Now, from there, we can head down into the forward wheel... into the um, nose wheel bay. And in here, we do check a couple of things. First of all, we just check the general condition of the nose wheel. We check that there is nothing leaking, etc. And then we also check for the conditions of the control cables. And you can see those down here. So these are the control cables that go to, or that are used to steer the nose wheel. And we make sure that those cables are especially undamaged. We also make sure that there is no bird sticking in here, as could happen if the aircraft had a bird strike on the arrival. Next up, we check the condition of the nose wheels themselves. And we generally make sure that there is um, no damages to the tires, that the tires are properly on their fittings, and that there are generally no fluids leaking from here. So with that done, we just go ahead a little bit to get a general overview of the aircraft, make sure that it's straight and that there is nothing that's um, especially vulnerable or broken down here. Moving on to the side, we've got the... First officer and the um, standby pitot tube. Then we also have our AOA vane down here. And moving further to the back, if the external power access panel is open, just make sure that there is um, no damages and that there is nothing in here that's not supposed to be there. Alright, moving on then. As we get across any door, we always make sure that the door handle is flush with the fuselage and that the door itself does not show any signs of damages. Moving further on to the side then, we've got our static ports and we make sure that there is nothing obstructing those ports, especially if the aircraft has been under maintenance. There might be some small stickers on there, for example when it's getting washed, that prevent any of the fluid from entering the system. Also, if you are operating under winter conditions, make sure that there is no icing anywhere nearby. Even the smallest bit of frost within the area of the um, static ports could cause a significant misreading of the altimeters. Moving further to the back then, we've got the inlet area of our packs. And you can see that the ram air door is extended over here, but we want to have a look behind that to make sure that there are no birds nesting in there, because this is a nice and warm place during winter time and during uh, spring, so birds are very prone to build up nests in there. Next up, we are going to move a little bit backwards, check the condition of our landing lights and the leading edge flap, and then we can already start having a look at our CFM Leap 1B engine. We check the general condition of the engine, and then over here we check that the thrust reverser deactivation pins are not installed. Moving further on, we have a look inside the engine and make sure that the acoustic lining over here is undamaged and that all the leading edges of the fans are undamaged. And also the P12 probe up here is in a good shape. Moving on to the side, again we check the general condition, we check for any thrust reverser deactivation pin, we check that all the latches are properly closed and 
we do also have a look below the engine to check for any scratch marks that you may find down here. You only need approximately 80 degrees of bank angle in order to stretch your engines on the ground so there is a certain chance that this might happen for this reason we are going to check down here that there is no damages so moving on then next up we are going to check the leading edge of the wing and also check the refueling panel make sure that it is properly latched and closed if it is not currently in use coming along to the side of the wing on the right side of the aircraft we have two green position lights and moving around the um, back of our split scimitar winglet we check for all the static wick dischargers to be in place over here moving along the trailing edge again we check for any kind of damages and for bird strikes and as we get to the landing gear we also have a quick look inside the back of the engine to be sure that there is nothing in there that's not meant to be there Next up we are going to check the condition of the landing gear itself and that means checking the tires for any damage. Over here checking all of the hydraulic and um, brake systems and then we have a look at the brake wear indicator pins that are located up here and up here and we make sure that those pins are not flush with the metal. If these pins are flush with the metal, then the brake is worn down and must no longer be used. Next up, we are going to enter the main wheel well, and in here we check for several things. We start with the hydraulic reservoirs that we have for system A and system B on the top over here. In the real world, there is also a little pressure gauge or a little um, quantity indicator on those reservoirs, which we would check to check for the actual hydraulic quantity. Then we are going to have a look at the hydraulic standby system reservoir that we can find over here. And once again we check to make sure that the um, quantity is alright. And in general we have a look around the gear bay to make sure that there is nothing leaking over here. A lot of vital aircraft systems come together in this area of the aircraft. So this is something, if there's something broken in the aircraft, chances are you might find it in here in the wheel well. So, with no damages found, let's go ahead and move on towards the back of our aircraft. Moving further back then, we've got the APU air inlet door over here, which we make sure is not obstructed and no birds or any visible damages. The same for the outflow valve, and we also do have a look inside here to make sure that there are no objects that are not supposed to be there. Check the condition of the door, make sure that the door handle is flush. On the top of the vertical stabilizer, you have the um, elevator fuel pedo probes, which we make sure are unobstructed and undamaged. Check the leading edge of the vertical stabilizer and make sure that the static wick dischargers are in place on the side. As we move along the back of the aircraft, there's a couple things for us to check over here. First of all, make sure that there is no damages to the APU outlet and also check the position lights that you've got located back here to be illuminated. From here we are going to move forward and check the tail skid and that's a few things that we are checking over here. First of all we make sure that there are no scrap marks on the back over here or over here. Now these are the points that would make contact with the runway first if any, if any uh, tail strike were, was to occur. Now we also have a general look at the APU compartment that we can see over here to make sure that there are no fluids leaking out of here. On the other side we basically check the same that we've already checked on the right hand side of the aircraft. So we check our leading edges, we move along the front, make sure that there are no damages, door handle is flush. And then we can move further forward. Again, as we get to the landing gear, be sure to check the brake wear indicator pins up here and up here to ensure that you have sufficient brake energy left. Moving along the um, side of the wheels, we ensure that there are no damages and that there is sufficient profile left on the wheels. Also make sure that there are no birds sticking anywhere in here and that the and that the uh, landing gear lockout pins are not in place, which would be located over here. Small hint, if those are in place and you try to retract the landing gear, you're going to be in for a bad surprise, as in nothing will happen. 
Let's move into the wheel well on this side then. We have already checked the hydraulic systems that you can see here, but what we're checking on this side is the fire bottles, the fire extinguisher bottles. And you have a general overlook over those bottles, and over here as well as over here, you would have the um, pressure inside the bottles indicated. Make sure that this is sufficient and acceptable for the flight, aka not in the red range. So then we can move further forward again. And as we walk along the back side of the wing, we once again have a look inside the um, engine to be sure that there is nothing there that's not supposed to be there. And moving further forward, we check for the condition of the flaps, the condition of the ailerons. And getting to the winglet, we make sure that there are no damages, especially to the lower side of the winglet. Ensure the static wick dischargers are in place. And on the left hand side of the aircraft, you want to be sure to see that right or to see that red navigation light here, ideally two bulbs. If one of the two bulbs is broken, then you are still allowed to fly, but it does have to be entered on the uh, tech lock and the aircraft has to be dispatched according to the minimum equipment list. Also ensure that there is no damage to the strobe light that you can see down here. Moving along the leading edge of the wing then, we ensure that there is no damages from any bird strikes that might have happened. And we check the engine just like we did on the other one, making sure that the thrust reverser deactivation pins are not in place. Having a look below the engine to be sure that there are no scrap marks. Check for the uh, doors to be closed. And moving to the leading edge then, we once again check all of our fan blades. It's also a good idea to have a look behind the fan blades, as you can see the core of the engine back there. And just to check whether there's any feathers or anything sticking out over there. I did already find some feathers down here in the core with nothing visible on the outer side on the fan at all. Last but not least, we are going to have a look at the other side. Again, thrust reversal lockout pin is not in. The engine itself is showing a generally good shape. And getting to the leading edge flap over here, no damages. The landing light is in a good shape. The air inlet for the um, packs is showing no sign of damages or birds. And last but not least, before we finish our walk around, we are going to have a look at the static ports on this side to be sure that there is no obstructions and no damages on these ports. And that concludes the walk around in our Boeing 737 MAX. Now let's go ahead and go back inside. And from here we are going to start our pre-flight procedures. So. The last thing we are going to do for this tutorial is to do a basic safety check and that is, first of all, we are going to do the oxygen check. In order to do the oxygen check, we do the following things. First of all, we check the oxygen quantity up here on the crew oxygen indicator. When that is checked, we hold the press to test button and observe that we get airflow for about 1-2 to two seconds. With that button down, we now also press the emergency button that we have down here, and that is going to give us a continuous airflow. While that is ongoing, we once again have a look at the crew oxygen indicator gauge up here, and we make sure that there is no great variations over here in the pressure as we do the check. The check itself should last for approximately 5 seconds. From here we move on to the EFIS control panel, and we ensure that terrain is selected so that weather is not active. There can only be one active, either weather or terrain, and we want to make sure that terrain is the active mode so that you are not accidentally running the weather radar on the ground, causing harm to people in front of the aircraft. We do the same on our colleagues' EFIS control panel over here to make sure that the weather radar is indeed selected. That concludes our um, preliminary um, safety inspection and our walk around. I hope that you found this one interesting. Be sure to leave your feedback in the comments below. As always, like, comment and subscribe. And if you're up for more, be sure to hit that little bell as that is going to give you notifications for when future videos are uploaded. Thank you very much for watching. Be sure to like, comment and subscribe. And if you really love what I'm doing on this channel, I would appreciate a small donation through the Buy Me Coffee link in the video description below. Thank you for watching and see you all again on the next one.